This is the story of a Nigerian scammer who laundered hundreds of millions of dollars, much of which likely ended up in the hands of North Korea, whose downfall came about through his own seeking of celebrity status and flaunting of extreme wealth, and kind of trying to be an influencer. It's a tale of its time. Oh! Raman Abbas, who later became known as Hush Puppy, and who for almost a decade flooded Instagram with photos of himself living the high life, didn't need to be an influencer, or really have any public presence. In fact, his extravagance helped him pop up on law enforcement's radar. Like so many of the shysters of the airwaves, his ego was ultimately self-defeating. Abbas grew up very poor in Lagos in Nigeria. His father was a cab driver, and his mother sold bread on the side of the road. As a child, almost every day he would go to a woman in his neighbourhood who sold food on credit to children who didn't have any money. At some point in his youth, Abbas got involved with Yahoo, a term used to describe a particular brand of fraud. According to Adadeji Oyanuga, a criminologist who studies cybercrime at Lagos State University, Young men in Lagos began to dabble in online scamming in the early 2000s, when cyber cafes first started appearing and unemployment was rising. That and a ruthlessly corrupt government meant there was seemingly little opportunity to get out of the slums. Some wannabe scammers congregated at a cafe in Bariga, which is adjacent to Abbas's home neighborhood, and used free Yahoo email accounts to operate digital scams. They came to be known as Yahoo Boys, and would seek out Magus, which roughly translates to gullible mark. The scams were not always like the hacker cliché of breaking into a server through a back door and changing the source code. Really, they were cons. Taking advantage of blind spots in bureaucracy, pretending to be other people, taking advantage of trust. They were not always especially sophisticated. The scams would evolve over the next decade, including check cashing scams, money order fraud, romance fraud, and business email compromise fraud, or BEC. BECs are worth a lot of money. According to the FBI, BECs are the number one most costly form of cybercrime in the US, accounting for 40% of all funds stolen. But we don't hear about these types of crimes very often, because they are highly embarrassing to the companies that get defrauded. BEC fraud occurs all over the world, and pinpointing where it started is difficult, but many BEC scammers have been traced to West Africa, so the cybersecurity industry thinks it may have started there. Typically, first someone hacks into a corporate email account. There may be actual hacking involved, but more often it's done using social engineering tactics, like phishing or even guessing at passwords and exploiting poor security. Once they have access to their target email account, the scammer begins forwarding copies of incoming and outgoing mail to themselves, and may spend weeks or months watching the activities of the business, waiting for a large invoice to come in or out. The idea is, is that when the right opportunity comes along, the scammer inserts themselves into the transaction and reroutes it to a different bank account. This can work in several ways. In a scenario where the recipient of funds has been compromised, the scammer might create an invoice identical to the real one, but with the bank account info changed, and resend it from the email account that they've hacked, along with a message apologizing for the mix-up. Another scenario is where the scammer creates a spoof email account very similar to a real one from the company. In some cases, they might create fake websites that look identical to the real website, but with one letter changed, or some other slight difference. Like I say, more of a con than what you might traditionally think of as hacking. Sort of like the corporate equivalent of, you're not the usual Brinks truck guy. No, he's ill. And the money changing hands isn't small. Many of these transactions are in the millions of dollars. 
It seems crazy that someone in a corporate office would send millions of dollars to a scammer without it being caught beforehand, but it happens all the time. According to Crane Hassold, who works in cyber defense research, these attacks are so realistic looking, most people don't give it a second thought. Because when you're involved in payments like these, you see a lot of these emails every single day. And when it doesn't raise any red flags, you are not going to go up the chain and do any confirmation. One would expect that when you get into the larger and larger amounts of money that are exchanging hands, that there would be some process that requires secondary authorization or something like that. But in many cases, that's not what actually happens. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Essentially, it isn't that the scammers are exceptionally good at what they're doing, but rather that the victims have poor defence. According to Hassold, the main tool of BEC fraud, social engineering tactics, has been around for a long time and isn't too dissimilar from traditional phishing and romance schemes or the I am a Nigerian princess for monies please scams of old. The main difference is that these fraudsters are now targeting large companies instead of individuals because they can make a lot of money on large corporate transactions. In BEC scams, the groups running them are very loosely networked with each person involved taking a small cut of the total funds stolen. There are different levels in the scam. First you have the hackers who actually break into the accounts. Then there are the money mules who are often people tricked into opening bank accounts using romance scams or phishing. Then you have the loaders or the money launderers who control international bank accounts that can accept large amounts of money and redistribute that money to the mule accounts around the world, where the money gets split up among other participants. They might also try to launder the money by buying assets such as property or gold, or through legitimate business that take in physical cash, or by converting it into cryptocurrency and using software to pass the money back and forth hundreds of times. These crimes are committed by loosely affiliated and ever mixing rings of criminals, of which Abbas was one of the most successful loaders. There are many ways to launder money, but probably, however you're going to do it, you should keep a low profile. I'm thinking. <laughs> Around 2014, Abbas left Lagos and went to live in Kuala Lumpur. This came around the same time that Nigerian security forces were cracking down on cybercrime boot first, and Abbas was not the only Yahoo boy to flee. In Kuala Lumpur, Abbas became far more active on social media than he ever had been before, and branded himself as Hush Puppy, as a billionaire Gucci master, and as a shining example of how others might also get out of poverty too, if they just work hard enough. In his apartment in Kuala Lumpur, he took photos of himself from head to toe to show off his designer outfits. He would caption the posts with inspirational messages, plus hashtags for the brands he was wearing. Over time, he began to attract thousands of likes and followers. The overall message of his brand on Instagram could be described as, I grew up poor, I became rich, you can do it too, just believe in yourself. Hashtag Gucci, hashtag Louis Vuitton, hashtag Versace, hashtag Cartier, hashtag Fendi. His messaging is weirdly rife with the same jargon and positive feedback that you see in people who run MLMs or cults. It's the language of, you can be rich and successful, like me. But Abbas was never trying to directly sell people a solution such as a book about how to get rich, or an MLM scheme, or whatever. He was just selling the idea of success and wealth in itself. In fact, he was notoriously suspiciously quiet about where he made his money whenever he was asked, only saying that he was a real estate investor, although he never really had a great deal of real estate. In 2015, Abbas moved from Kuala Lumpur to Dubai as his wealth mysteriously began to grow even more. 
he began spending a lot of time with another influencer, Ismaili Mustafa, known as Momfa, who had a very similar style of account, flaunting luxury goods. By this time, Abbas was becoming sort of a celebrity in Nigeria. In 2016, Abbas, or rather Hush Puppy, and Momfa were mentioned in a song called Living Things by Nigerian musician Nine Ice. Hush Puppy Temini, invest the BJ Temini, Mofa Temini. Golden haired Merkin, hanging out my Birkin, camels and needles, but the devil be smirkin. Motherfucker. These connections helped him grow his following, as did getting into public feuds, both real and performed. In 2017, he got into a beef with a pop star called Davido, claiming that he hadn't paid a tab at a Lagos nightclub. They later made a video together where they made up, which further increased Abbas's following. Later, he got into another spat with the musicians Fino and Ice Prince, accusing them of wearing fake luxury watches. In another feud, the singer KC drew on the increasing suspicion surrounding Abbas's wealth. Abbas and Momfa later publicly accused each other of fraud. Part of what makes this whole thing interesting is how Hush Puppy wasn't just pretending at being an influencer. By all accounts, he really did get lots of brand sponsorships and related tat for his Instagram posts. Major luxury fashion brands were sponsoring him. In January 2015, Abbas shared a video on Instagram where he was given a gift from the Versace store in Kuala Lumpur, along with his friend Samson Oikonoli, for being the best customers of 2014. In the video, Abbas says that he just spent $20,000 in the store that day. You spent 20,000 years, okay? I just spent 20,000. Mm. <laughs> he got custom shoes from Christian Louboutin, a custom made purple Rolls Royce, an all expense trip to the Ritz Paris for Fashion Week as a VIP guest of Louis Vuitton, a dinner invitation, quote, by Fendi to dine with a lot of amazing, strong societal giants. There are many accounts of him shopping at Dubai's malls every day, spending tens of thousands every day. He became entwined with prestigious brands, at least in that he received a lot of free goods and services and gained a lot of access and posted a lot of ad-like stuff. His social media activity really helps draw a picture of who Abbas really is, especially with one of my favorite posts, a photo of himself in a hot tub in the Greek islands of Santorini, captioned with the title, Letter to the Ghetto Kid, which sort of reads like a manifesto about how rich people and governments don't care about poor people. It's quite a read. Why did he do this? There's no way brand sponsorship fees could ever be enough to hide the tens of millions Abbas and his associates were regularly pilfering. And although I don't know the details of his sponsorships, it seems like he became an influencer by buying his way in. Gucci and the rest started to give him stuff for free because he kept buying stuff and posting about it anyway. So why not give him some t-shirts with a logo? I mean, what does this crap actually cost Gucci to make? 50 cents? So, after years of fellow Instagrammers, especially those from Nigeria, questioning where his money came from, the answer finally began to bubble to the surface. As it turns out, Interpol and the FBI also wanted to know where Abbas's money came from and had been watching him for quite a while without being able to pinpoint exactly who he was. On October the 12th, 2018, he posted to Instagram a photo of his birthday cake, a gift from the brand Fendi, which artfully depicts Abbas in his signature, look at this stuff I bought, don't look at my stuff, pose. Investigators were, indeed, able to use his date of birth from the Instagram post to track him to a visa application. From there, they were able to learn who he really was and begin to track how he was making his money. It became clear to the FBI and Interpol 
that Abbas had been laundering money for several years, but they needed to place him under surveillance for months to get something concrete on him. So here are some of the things that they found. In January 2019, Abbas received a message from a friend named Alumari, who was also a money loader. He had been working on BEC scams for years, including one case where he stole $10 million from a Canadian university. Abbas and Alumari communicated on Snapchat about an upcoming series of transactions. Alumari said that he needed two bank accounts in Europe and that he could receive up to 5 million euros without attracting attention and he needed them by February the 12th. Abbas said that he had a Romanian account that could handle it. The payments were coming from a bank in Malta, which had been compromised months before in an ambitious scheme where hackers had broken into the French stock regulator and sent emails to the Malta bank in question pretending to be those regulators, and were thus able to gain access to the bank's secure payment system. On February the 1st, Alumari messaged back to say that the money was confirmed for February the 12th, and that he would now need four bank accounts to handle the transactions. A few days later, he upped this to six accounts, and said that all of them would be credited with 5 million euros at the same time on February the 12th. Throughout these conversations over several weeks, Abbas continued to post on Instagram as usual. Thank you guys for staying tuned and watching. Please like, subscribe and share. The next day, Alumari messaged back that he still needed one more bank account. Abbas sent him the details for a Bulgarian account. When February the 12th finally rolled around, Alumari messaged Abbas that only one of the wires had gone through for 500,000 euros, but the bank in Malta hadn't noticed yet, so they planned to try and hit it again the next morning. But when they did try this the next morning, the bank did notice that 13 million euros suddenly went missing and quickly shut down their entire electronic system as they tried to recall the money. The two men commiserated over the hall and planned to try another hit in a few weeks. All of this had been closely observed by the FBI and Interpol, but the two scammers had no idea and apparently no concern. It's interesting to note that all of this was being done using cell phones and Snapchat accounts that were actually owned by the two men, officially. They did not seem to take any kind of security precautions whatsoever. In April 2019, Alumari got in touch with Abbas and told him that a big haul was coming in, $300 million from an unnamed English Premier League team. The plan was to swap in bank account details on a large contract that would pay out weekly, using a bank account in Mexico that Abbas had set up. But when it came time for the scam to happen, Alumari found that the UK banks wouldn't pay into the account in Mexico. So they dropped the scam and waited for another. Later that year, they successfully hit a large law firm in New York for about a million dollars, intended as a payout to a client. And this money was split up and sent to several other accounts. Abbas sent a message to Alumari after the money hit, asking for confirmation and a screenshot. Alumari promised to give him one when his plane landed, but when he arrived, the FBI was waiting for him. The next day, Abbas's old Instagram friend, Momfa, was arrested at a Nigerian airport for fraud and money laundering. Think about this. You're this guy, and your friends start to get pinched internationally. All of the incriminating text conversations they've ever had with you are all in the hands of law enforcement somewhere. And when you think about it, the breadcrumb trail leads directly to you everywhere. Probably it would be a good idea to now disappear. I'm thinking. No. Abbas continued posting on Instagram, but changed his bio from billionaire Gucci master to real estate developer. During this time, the FBI did indeed have access to Alamari's phone and all the very incriminating messages on there. And on June the 8th, 2020, Abbas and 11 others were arrested by Dubai authorities as part of a series of raids 
that confiscated 47 phones, 21 laptops, $7 million worth of luxury cars, $40 million in cash, and the addresses of almost 2 million victims of the fraud ring. Abbas was taken to the US and in April pled guilty to money laundering and wire fraud charges. He awaits sentencing but faces up to 20 years in jail. In one of the strangest twists in this case, in February of 2021, the US Justice Department revealed new details regarding the Malta Bank scam. As it turns out, the entire thing was being operated by state-sponsored North Korean hackers who were connected to Abbas via Alomari. It's possible that Abbas had no idea he was working with the North Koreans due to the loose nature of these networks of scammers. Really, it seems more likely that they used him and the other loaders as disposable proxies. North Korean participation in the other scams remains unclear, but in the Malta scam, the FBI believes that more than half of all the money stolen went to North Korean state-controlled bank accounts. Oh dear. What's my conclusion? Greed, pride, narcissism, Gucci. Sign of the times. Once, if you stole half a billion dollars, that would probably be enough, but now, apparently not. Apparently it's not enough without adoration too. Even if that adoration is bought, even if that adoration puts your liberty in jeopardy. It's like watching a society-wide madness unfold in real time. But I can't work out if it's the type of madness that's new. So it goes. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time. What a baffling world we live in. Know that.